Our next presentation is on the ethics of civility. Civility. And our presenters will be speaking of our colleague, Phil Durst, who was beloved by so many. Chris Hahn is Vice President of Employment Law at Dell Inc. He joined Dell after 15 years as an outside lawyer representing clients in all kinds of labor and employment matters, including litigation, training, and counseling. Chris is a graduate of Rice University and the University of Texas School of Law and is board certified in labor and employment law. Tom Nesbitt is a founding member of DeShazo and Nesbitt in Austin, where he represents employers. Tom earned his JD from the University of Texas School of Law in 1998. He's been listed in Best Lawyers in America and as a super lawyer in the practice of labor and employment law. Previously, Tom was with the Austin office of Fulbright and Jaworski. He is board certified in labor and employment law. I had to do some internet sleuthing to make Tom's introduction. I recommend you read his bio in the materials. None of what I just read is in there. It reads like a social media profile, including his likes and dislikes. The one professional recognition he lists is being allowed to speak today about his good friend, Phil Durst. Thank you, Chris and Tom. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, my name is Tom Nesbitt, and I know Phil. I've known I knew Phil for about 20 years, and he was when I started practicing law in Austin in 1998 the gold standard of plaintiff side lawyers. And I know him mainly through being his opposing counsel in frequent cases and speaking with him. And, and as all of us did, loving listening to him speak at this conference and other conferences. You know, we are very lucky in the labor and employment bar across the state to have a very strong culture of civility. I think that is, uh, we have a stronger one compared to other practices. Um, we tend to resolve our differences on substance and not on personal attacks. And uh, of course, that's not always true. We had a, a, an Austin Bar uh, a presentation or a, a panel discussion on Wednesday of this week. And I really, I just kind of ask people to speak. And but as I'm introducing them, I get an email from one of our colleagues who says, Tom, you're the you're the leading in our entire bar. Who are you to lecture us on civility? And, you know, that was uh, Shafika Giratani. Y'all know Shafika. I mean, I've known her half her life. She's usually sweet, but uh, she had a good point. And Chris and I are not here to lecture anybody about civility. We are here to hopefully reminisce about Phil Durst. And, and I think, Chris, I may be stealing your thunder a little bit here. Chris made the point to me, you know, Phil Durst never lectured anybody about civility. He never threw rules at people or the lawyer's creed. He lived it. And so what, what I want to do first is just for those of you who didn't know Phil, say a few personal uh, words about him and talk me talk about him as a, as, as a human being. And then Christopher and I will kind of take turns sharing some stories of our own and from other people about Phil's great civility. Mm -hmm. Phil was passed away on October 1st, 2019. He was only 62 years old. Phil leaves a legacy of great legal skill of humor, of art, and also the lessons that he taught us about how to practice law with civility. And, you know, if we don't observe those norms, we, we will lose them. And I fear that when we lost Phil Durst, especially in Austin, we lost the heart and soul of that culture. And so we hope through remembering him to uh, try to preserve that culture. Phil was first and foremost a lawyer of great skill and ability, uh, UT Law School graduate 1982. He was a professor at the UT Law School for 20 years. He spoke at many conferences, including this conference every year. Many of you remember his presentations recently that were the what is it worth presentation. He would send out a set of hypothetical, common hypothetical case situations to plaintiffs, lawyers, and defense lawyers. And it was a survey and you were essentially asked to evaluate the hypothetical case and say what it's worth. And uh, Phil would then consolidate those uh, that feedback and, and, and analyze it and then presented it. It was always a very informative way. And I think it was one of the ways, one of the many ways Phil succeeded in uh, uh, bringing us together in some respect, helping us understand each other, helping us to understand where we agree on things, where we disagree on things. Uh, one of his many contributions 
to uh, to our bar. Um, I think it also spoke volumes of Phil's integrity that defense lawyers, I, I'm one of those, all the defense lawyers submitted our values to Phil with absolute certainty that he would honor what he told us, which is that I won't even look at these. He had a process. I don't know what the process was. I never asked him of treating those responses in an anonymous way, even to himself. And we trusted that Phil did that because we trusted Phil. And that speaks to uh, his great integrity. Phil fought for causes and supported causes in his life, including the Save Our Springs Alliance, uh, dedicated to preservation of our springs here in Austin. He was a founding member of the Texas Freedom Network. He supported the Equal Justice Center. Uh, Phil, of course, had a sparkling sense of humor. Lawyers, we're, we're not funny. We just aren't. Phil, though, was world-class funny. Uh, every year, his picture in the Austin Bar Association, you know, alongside all of everybody with their suits and their business coats, Phil's always was some ridiculous picture. Phil wearing a wrestling mask. Phil, um, you know, Phil running from the plane uh, in, in North by Northwest. Uh, Phil on the aircraft carrier deck uh, as George W. Bush. Uh, whenever he spoke at this or other conferences, Phil refused to be introduced by reading off his accomplishments. He would always write his own introductions, and they always began with our speaker. Our next speaker insisted that I read the following statement, and it was always something absurd and hilarious, and usually Phil was the butt of the joke, or maybe the introducer was the butt of a gentle joke from Phil. Uh, and Phil, Phil used his humor in the courtroom to great effect. I, I, in his last hearing that I was uh, adverse to him in, there were three parties and everybody was kind of looking around like preparing to fight over who would go first where there were these dueling motions. And so, but Phil just stood up and said, uh, Judge, I'm the most handsome, so I'm going to go first. Uh, and that's, you know, what were we going to say to that? Nothing. And he got to go first. Now, I, I, my memory has been challenged on that. Uh, somebody suggested that what Phil really said was, I'm the most handsome, so I'll be glad to go last. But either way, uh, Phil uh, used that sense of humor to great effect. His business cards noted, they bragged that his law office was air conditioned. Uh, at Phil's funeral in October, he wrote his own eulogy to be delivered at his funeral, and it was characteristically Phil. It was uplifting. It was hilarious. It ended with Phil from the grave insisting that they play the monkey song, I'm a believer, over the synagogue's speaker system, and he insisted that everyone get up and as they left, dance to I'm a believer by the monkeys. Uh, that's just the kind of guy Phil was. Phil was also an artist. M many of you may have memories of Phil at this conference, sitting out in the audience when he was not speaking, and he'd be tearing up pieces of paper, using scissors. Elizabeth fled us using scissors, uh, uh, you know, sewing things, tying things with string. Phil was creating his beautiful collage art. He was a serious artist, and many people in Austin knew Phil as a renowned artist. They didn't even know he was a lawyer. Uh, he would make this out of Starbucks cups, out of dumb, dumb wrappers, this kind of thing. Phil said this about his art. As quilts were traditionally made with scraps of leftover fabrics, I like to work with materials that have also been cast off or designed for other purposes. I enjoy working with paint chips, old books, candy boxes, and other packaging that all have such beauty, even though they were not designed to last. We, there would be many reasons to strive to want to emu, to want to, to want to strive to emulate Phil Durst, um, but I believe that the heart of who Phil Durst was as a professional colleague is someone who, even in the heat of conflict, was always civil. He was civil in a profession where it is hard to be civil. Um, and, and, and I, I've asked myself over the last few months, what was it about Phil, and how can I try to be more like him? I mean. Phil was so superbly talented as a lawyer that perhaps he was so confident that he didn't need to be uncivil as a crutch, as some of us do. Uh, it could be that he had such a, a natural self-deprecating sense of humor that it immunized him in some way from, from being petty. 
Uh, and it may be that he saw in opposing counsel and even in opposing parties some beauty in the same way that he saw beauty in these cast off scraps of paper that he created beautiful art out of. But whatever it was, Phil had it. And what I'm going to do is, is uh, uh, with Christopher Hahn is we want to talk about how he, that was not only uh, a trait that made it a pleasure to be adverse to Phil. It was effective. Phil used his great civility to be an effective lawyer uh, and one that, you know, people on both sides of the uh, of the bar want to emulate. And, and I'm going to, we're going to do a little bit of what Phil never would do. And that is, you know, I guess to get, you know, y'all all want your ethics credit. I want it too. And I think Phil would want us to have our ethics credit. So we're going to cite a few rules. Um, but mainly we want to tell this story about what Phil through his actions tried to teach us. And we're going to kind of hand that, you know, Christopher really is the the visionary behind this hierarchy, this civility hierarchy that, you know, at a base level, there are things, there are rules, there are guidelines you need to follow to just protect your law license, to comply with the basic rules. And then above that, there are procedural rules that we are expected to act in accordance with. And then at the top of the pyramid, there is, there are rules and norms, most of them non-binding, that go to protecting the integrity and honoring the profession. And, and Phil did that so effectively. Phil lived the lawyer's creed. This is a non, you're all familiar with it. You probably have it in as part of your representation letters. It, it's a non-binding aspirational statement of how we ought to practice law. I, I am a lawyer. I am entrusted by the people of Texas to preserve and improve our legal system. I must abide by the rules, but I know that professionalism requires more than merely avoiding a violation of the rules. And I am committed to this creed for no other reason than that it, than that it is right. And it begins with these five uh, aspirational statements uh, about what duties a lawyer owes to the profession itself, uh, to the administration of, ju of justice uh, and, and integrity and independence. So I am passionately proud. My word is my bond. I am responsible to ensure that all persons have access to competent representation regardless of wealth or position in life. That, is one of, that was one of Phil's great causes. Uh, the, no, I commit myself to an adequate, adequate and effective pro bono program. Uh, I'm obligated to educate my clients. There, there's a, I'm not going to talk about the cases in the paper. There's some pretty interesting cases in the paper. Um, one of them is an order that came out during this COVID-19 epidemic in a, where a federal judge, I think up in Illinois, had to deny like two different motions that a party filed to, for the judge to reconsider the decision to put off a TRO case in a trademark dispute over unicorn drawings. That's a great order to write. And the judge concludes his order denying this guy's ridiculous motion with a, <laughs> with a, a quote that was to the effect of sometimes the best thing you can do as a lawyer is tell your client that he or she is a damn fool and should stop asking you to do what they want you to do. Um, and then finally, I will be conscious to my, uh, of my duty to the judicial system. I'm going to turn it over to Christopher Hahn. Uh, Christopher's um, main interaction with Phil was, again, as an adverse uh, uh, opposing counsel. Phil has been a longtime in-house employment lawyer for Dell. Uh, he represented, a no Phil represented a number of Dell employees. And so, Christopher, I want to turn it over to you. Thanks, Tom. Um, and so I really want to emphasize the, the point that Tom made that Phil's civility was not just, you know, made it a pleasure to deal with him. It really made him substantially more effective as a plaintiff's lawyer. Uh, as an in-house lawyer, I, I've dealt with plaintiff's lawyers all over the country, in some cases all over the world. And I've seen, you know, all different kinds of lawyers. And a lot of times there, there are fights that are so utterly unnecessary and don't advance the interest of the client. Phil was quite literally the opposite of that. Uh, over the years, he represented a number of current and former employees of Dell um, bringing claims against the company, and we were able to resolve every single one of them without so much as a filing. And I don't mean a filing of a lawsuit. There were no files of a charge, no filings of anything, because Phil would make contact in a way that from the outset was trying to get the resolution that was most beneficial to his client. And so the first thing I want to talk about, and Tom, if you'll go to the next slide, 
is that opening of the 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 opening salvo. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me let me hit the the three or four points of the lawyer's creed. That the second section of the lawyer's creed is lawyer to lawyer, and I think you know Phil lived these in all of his dealings with me. Number one, being courteous and civil in all communications. Number two, never playing the gotcha game with documents and calling out any changes that he made. But the really important ones are not being disagreeable when disagreeing, recognizing that you can advance the interest of your own client without casting aspersions on the other side. And that number 10, I think, is really one of the most critical from, from an effectiveness standpoint that really demonstrated you know, Phil's strengths is he could uh, really communicate his client's concerns and issues without casting aspersions, not only on opposing counsel, but on other witnesses in the case or the client. And so now, Tom, if you'll go to the next one. So F Phil, uh, in our first dealings, would, would send a nice formal demand letter. And, and towards the later end of his life, he would just pick up the phone and call me. But all of his initial uh, communications were civil. He did not make personal attacks on me or the company or, or even the individuals within the company with whom his client had a beef. When he made factual assertions in the, uh, the demand letter, they would be accurate. And both of those things, I really can't emphasize how important they are because when I get a demand letter from a plaintiff's lawyer, I'm gonna have to take it to the decision makers who are being accused of the bad acts. Not only am I gonna have to, to walk them through the, the demand letter accusations, these are also the people I'm asking for money. So if I'm gonna try and resolve this case, I'm gonna be hitting their P&L statement, I'm gonna be hitting their budget with money um, to come out of their pockets to settle the dispute. And when the, the demand letter I receive starts with an attack and accuses them of egregious behavior and says that they're bad people and they did bad things, we're setting the tone in a very negative way. And it's going to take me some amount of time just to get them back to level before we can ever begin to talk resolution. When the plaintiff's lawyers sometimes hear a story from their client and then write up the most egregious facts that their client can mention in the letter, and I take that to the decision maker who's being accused of the wrongdoing, and those facts are not true, or any number of them are not true, then I've got a, a client who is going to dig in and wants to argue and says, this is all based on a false premise. There's no reason for us to settle at all because none of this is true. Phil had a way of making sure that if he had um, you know, very negative factual allegations, he would temper them. He would temper the tone and he would temper, you know, say it is my client's understanding that these things happened. He would make it so that it wasn't a, this absolutely happened and your guys are bad guys. That goes a long way for me to be able to go to that client and say, listen, you know, there's a different perspective here. This is the way they view it. And that's why we should be um, thinking about resolution. Another critical thing from that initial demand letter is I get demand letters every week where there is a number demanded that has no basis in reality, where I will do a generous calculation of back pay, front pay, compensatories, look at the number that I've calculated, and then look at the demand, and the demand is some multiple of, of complete and full relief. Phil never did that. And as Tom pointed out, he used to use this seminar as an opportunity to try and level set amongst the, the, the practitioners, hey, let's get to the point where we can see a range of value in a case that's all within the range of, of reasonableness. Um, let's not have you know defense side lowballing things to a number that doesn't make any sense at all. And let's have, not have plaintiff's lawyers making sky high demands because that really prevents us from getting to where we want to be, and that is getting a resolution that's beneficial for the client. Another thing that, that Phil was awesome about was in the preservation demand. I get a, at least one demand letter a month with the attachments of all the things that they expect me to do to preserve evidence, to get every um, backup hard drive, backup tape drive from every email system, from every system within the company, not maybe the, the lawyer on the other side doesn't recognize that what they're asking me to do is a hundred thousand dollars worth of preservation work to pull from as many systems as a company this size has, and that's ridiculous. And then we're going to spend the next three or four weeks fighting over cost sharing and what is real, um, a legitimate uh, 
preservation order or a legitimate legal hold process in light of the claims being brought. Phil started with the assumption that knowing that a sophisticated company is going to send out legal holds, and if he thought that there was something specific that his client needed and to make sure that that was held, he would give me a very narrowly tailored, very specific, hey, you know, one of the issues in this case is going to be um, the promotion question from last fall. Please make sure that you're securing all the information about all the candidates for the promotion, et cetera. So with that narrow tailored request, there was nothing for me to argue with and naturally I would do it. So Tom, if you'll go to the next slide, then the next thing is we would be, you know, the, the, the battle has been joined, so let's start battling. Except with Phil, it was really hard to because he followed the ABC rule, always be cordial. Every conversation was laced with humor and good nature and good spirits. When we disagreed on factual things, he would be non-disagreeable. He would say, you know, things like that the other perspective is. And one thing that made Phil really, really effective in negotiations is that he would readily acknowledge that he has a single source of information, and that is an aggrieved person who is his client. And he would recognize that there are other sides to the story. And he would be open to hearing facts that contradicted his client's facts, and he would never make it sound like, you know, the, the facts he had were rock solid. And, and, you know, if you didn't buy into them and you wouldn't agree with his version of the facts, we couldn't settle it because that's ineffective. When, when I go to my client and say, they insist that these things happen. And if they didn't happen, my client's going to dig in. There's no way I'm going to get them to authorize a settlement throughout the negotiations. Phil always conveyed a, an aura of, I am trying to do right by my client. It was never a pissing contest where he was trying to get a win, where he was trying to say, I'm going to beat you. I'm going to beat Dell. It was always in terms of trying to get the best result for his client. So the next subject matter I want to talk about in one more slide is when we get down to resolution, I've had a number of deals with, with plaintiff's lawyers that I thought were done get completely blown up when we were trying to, to write up the paperwork. And the, the fastest way to kill a, a deal would be for somebody to make a change and not point it out. Phil never did that. And I never had to, you know, do a compare right or anything with the document because th that was just so outside of his personality that it would never happen. And I could implicitly trust any document that he sent back. But two other ways, and, and it actually ties into the lawyer's creed that, that suggests that, you know, you pick your battles and fight over the things that matter and not the peripheral stuff. Phil was awesome about not quibbling over stupid stuff. I, I deal with a, a lot of cases that we're close to resolution and I send out our form paperwork, which we've done for quite literally thousands of cases. And all of those provisions are in there for a reason. And Phil recognized that. He, he knew I was not trying to gain any kind of unfair advantage or something that wasn't discussed in the settlement, that these were provisions that we needed um, as, as a corporation that may be different than, than you, what you might deal with a smaller company or, or a, a sole proprietorship. And Phil was great at recognizing that we had limitations as a gigantic corporation, that there were some things that just simply weren't going to be mutual. And the classic example is a confidentiality provision where I would say to the, the plaintiff, you have to keep this confidential and can only tell, you know, lawyers, tax advisors, spouse, and, you know, a very narrow group. And I wouldn't tie my hands so closely. And I've had many a lawyer fight over that. And I would walk them through the explanation that I've got auditors, I've got finance people, I've got tax people. There are a lot of people who are going to have to know about the terms of this settlement agreement. Phil picked his battles. He wouldn't fight over those things that really don't advance the ball that much for his client, recognizing what the company needed to get the deal done, all with a resolution to quickly and efficiently get a good result for his client. So his civility made him far more effective um, than, than just being a nice guy to deal with. So that's my inside perspective. Let me turn it back over to Tom. Let me just see. So, you know, I said earlier, I, I, my, my main dealings with Phil professionally were as adverse counsel. And we've cited some of these rules about, you know, uh, and it's, it's almost demeaning to Phil to go through some of these, quite frankly, because it would never enter Phil Durst's mind to reach a settlement agreement with me on key terms and then send me a settlement document that moved the ball out, you know, 25 yards from midfield where we started. It just would never enter his mind. It would never enter Phil's mind not to give me an extension on a discovery request 
that I asked for. You know, it would never uh, have entered Phil's mind to have a discovery dispute. I, I told this story. At the, we, we had a, a really beautiful Austin Labor and Employment Section Bar event on Wednesday where a number of people spoke about Phil and his great civility. So I kind of got a head start on this. And, um, you know, the one story that I had to contribute, everybody contributed stories. And my story was about a situation where I had over designated a bunch of documents as attorney's eyes only in a non-compete trade secret case where Phil was on the other side. And, you know, Phil didn't call me up and, you know, gripe me out. He didn't, he didn't send me a nasty letter. He didn't question my motives. He invited me over to his office to have a discussion. And I went over there. And he said, look, man, let me just show you in practical terms how what you did is making my job in advising my own client harder. And will you consider this other approach? He was just dead right. I was wrong and he was right, but he <laughs> it was easy to get me to that conclusion because he just treated me with such respect when he did it. Uh, I want to I want to tell one other story as we're running out of time here that was told yesterday that I thought was so remarkable by a different lawyer. And this lawyer had first begun the presentation. I mean, talking about Phil by explaining that when he was a young lawyer at a big firm, after a case against Phil wrapped up, Phil invited him out to lunch and all this. And he was like kind of flustered by that because it had never happened. <laughs> you know, he didn't he didn't know that, 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 that you could do that as a young lawyer. But and he developed this relationship with Phil. And he was representing, he got one of these demand letters from Phil that was very civil, but but the lawyer said, look, I, I had to call him up and I had to say, hey, Phil, look, I, your legal theory is not viable. You don't, you, you know, you, you've explained a lot of facts that maybe seem unfair or whatever, but you don't have a legal theory. Help me understand what I'm supposed to tell my client your legal theory of liability is. And Phil said to him, and I'm probably butchering this, but this is in substance what it was, was go, please go tell your client this. Tell your client, my, my client has worked for them for a long time. The termination of her employment was, is, has been very hard on her. It's devastated her financially. She's not asking for an excessive amount of money. Ask them if they will accept this amount. And, 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 to, and to be clear, you're right. I have a, I have a very challenging <laughs> task of establishing any theory of liability, but it was effectively go tell them that to show compaid and use these words, but go, go ask them to, to, to pay this modest amount of money. <laughs> and the lawyer said, you know, I just thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll do what I, I'll do what Phil asked me to do. And he said, sure enough, the, the client said, okay, you know, just a perfect example of Phil. He was candid in a settlement negotiation where he could be candid. He was respectful. He had an instinct that the company might act on, uh, on their own impulses other than just the raw value of the case. Maybe they too could act with compassion. Uh, he had that instinct and he had a lawyer on the other side that he could trust to communicate that message. And it, it worked out for his client. It was successful for his client. I thought that was a remarkable story of, just who Phil Durst was and how he could pull that off because he had observed these rules and these norms and he had modeled this, this wonderful behavior. Last thing I'll say, I think we got about two minutes here. Uh, I have all this feedback from all these other lawyers that were, that was given at this thing on Wednesday. And, um, you know, another in-house lawyer, veteran in-house lawyer at a large Austin company, she said this, she said, look, when I was in-house, Phil represented about a dozen employees of ours. I never dreaded getting a call from Phil. I knew he was going to be reasonable. I knew he was going to do a good job for his client. I knew he was going to listen. He was going to listen to me. How often do we not li even listen to the opposing side? I, I do it all the time. He said he would listen. I knew he would listen to me. Uh, and I knew we would ultimately get to a reasonable outcome for both sides. Phil never threw the furniture. He always treated me decently and kindly. And that led to effective communication. Here's what I thought was, was really a, a valuable insight. I found it to be valuable. This lawyer said he was so decent with me and he was so reasonable with me that I felt a compulsion to reciprocate with that. And so it snowballed on itself and it got good outcomes for Phil's client. And that's our point here, I think, today, is that here was a guy that we lost too soon and we should be emulating because he practiced the way we're told to practice and it worked. It worked for him. Uh, we got about one more minute. Christopher, I wish you would cap us off here with if you want to 
say something about Phil. The last thing I would add, Tom, is um, Phil, um, you know, as our relationship got better, his humor was so incredible. Um, he is, it was largely self-deprecating or he, if he made a joke at somebody else's expense, it was only when he knew it was, it was the right situation and, and comfortable and he could disarm people so much with his humor, um, by, by just, especially the self-deprecating part, he could take a situation that was starting to get tense and he would be so funny at just the right time that he would get everybody a nice laugh. And we would remember that it's in nobody's interest to be fighting. It's in everybody's interest to get to the resolution. Very well, very well done. Thank you, Christopher.